has a knack for saying some pretty scandalous things. Last week, his words were scandalous for the rich man who couldn't wrap his mind around the truth that his life of comfort and control didn't get him into, into heaven. He was so self-centered, so turned in on himself that faith was forced out of his heart. It was this love of self, self that kept him from hearing Moses and the prophets, kept him from hearing the word which creates and sustains the inner life of faith. But this week, Jesus turns the life of faith outwards. And his words really aren't any less scandalous. The first thing he says is, is what orients us out. It's what orients the life, life of faith in the outward direction. Woe to the one through whom temptations to sin come, he tells the disciples. It would be better if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea. So right off the bat here, Jesus reveals that the life of faith isn't just my own personal religion. Instead, Jesus teaches us that each of us, that what each of us believes as individuals is shaped and influenced by all the other people around us. And this should strike us as a low scandal, shouldn't it? Especially for something as private as religion. Instead, we think, my religion, my faith in Jesus, this all belongs to me. There's nothing that anything can, that anyone else can do to, to change that. That's what we tell ourselves, and that's what the world tells us. But Jesus says otherwise. Parents, friends, <laughs> pastors, fellow church members, teachers, all of these people have a hand in shaping our faith, either for good or for ill. They can either build us up in the faith, or they can put out stumbling blocks that cause us to sin or even cause us to reject faith in Christ. And it's becoming a stumbling block that Jesus wants all of us who believe to watch out for. Pay attention to yourselves, he says. Don't worry about other people. Pay attention to yourselves and watch out. Make sure that you yourself aren't doing or saying something that could cause these little ones to sin and reject the faith. And usually when we hear, hear the word the little ones, you know, we think of our, our little kids running around and, and keeping them safe. But little ones includes not only children, but anyone who is new to the faith or who's weak in the faith. But the thing is, this can be a careful dance, right, when, when we're watching out for what we say. Because sometimes we don't even know when we're being a stumbling block. And that's why being attentive is so important. Do you remember a couple weeks ago, our dishonest manager, he was attentive. He paid attention to his needs, to the needs of his neighbor, and to the needs of his master. And so that attention is something that carries through here as well when we're paying attention to ourselves. The thing is, at the end of the day, whether we know it or not, the consequences for leading someone astray are severe. Jesus says, if you cause someone to reject the faith, you're better off dead. You're better off gasping for your last breath at the bottom of the sea with that millstone hanging around your neck. Because even there, you're technically better off than the person you led to reject the faith. And this, honestly, I think this should be a big one for parents. Because the eternal life of your children rests in your hands. And we hear in our epistle lesson today about, uh, about uh, Lois and Eunice, you know, uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother, and how they pass on a steadfast faith to Timothy. So, are you like Lois and Eunice? Are you fostering your children's faith? Are you praying for them and with them? Teaching them the faith at home, bringing them to church, or when they're a little older and off to college, reminding them to go to church. See, how you live the life of faith, whether you're a parent or a fellow church member or anything, how you live your life of faith matters because it sets the model for all of our little ones, for our children and for those new to the faith. We all have the duty to live the life of faith together as the family of Christ, building up one another on Christ, our cornerstone. The 
The second aspect of this outward life of faith that, that Jesus brings to light is repentance and forgiveness. Now, we've spent a little time talking about repentance and forgiveness individually, like our, ourselves before God. But now we see how this repentance and forgiveness gets turned outward and how it plays out between fellow Christians. If your brother sins, rebuke him, Jesus says, and if he repents, forgive him. So just as God rebukes us with his law when we sin against him, we should do the same thing for our neighbors who sin against us. And that's the thing. Christians take sin seriously, both our own and our neighbors. We take sin seriously because we take forgiveness seriously. We shouldn't be afraid to call out our, our fellow Christian sins because there can only be forgiveness if there's repentance. And when someone comes to us in repentance, then nothing should stop us from forgiving them. We should set aside any grudge or any harm that that person has done to us and forgive them. And that, I think, that's probably what makes forgiveness sound so scandalous to our own ears, right? Jesus tells us to forgive every time someone comes to us and repents. No matter how grave the offense, whether or not we think they're honestly sorry for what they did, we still forgive when someone comes and says, I'm sorry. Seventy times seven, remember Jesus telling Peter in Matthew's Gospel, our forgiveness for others should be unlimited because Christ's forgiveness is unlimited. And in reality, it's all the same forgiveness. The forgiveness we show to others is the same forgiveness that Christ has shown us. So it can never run out. And, and so that should bring us a little comfort because that forgiveness is unending. But then again, that doesn't make forgiving others any easier. It probably makes it harder because it would be easier, you know, so oh, I'm, I'm all out of forgiveness, I can't give any more. But we've got this unlimited supply of forgiveness from Christ that, that makes it difficult almost to, to keep forgiving. And this is what the apostles recognize. You know, after Jesus says this, they come up to him and, and tell him, increase our faith. You know, even we, as, as the chosen twelve, there's no way we could do this. Even, we can't do it without this special boost of faith from you, Jesus. But the thing is, it's not the quantity of faith, it's the quality. You can have faith the size of a mustard seed and tell a mulberry tree to plant itself in the seed, and it will do it. In other words, what that tells me is it doesn't take much faith at all. And I think Jesus means this as a comfort. You don't have to work for a bigger and better faith to be able to forgive more and more and more. It only takes the smallest faith that that simple trust in him that the Romans have. That's all, it, that's all it takes to make this forgiveness happen. And when, when it's planted by the word, when that, that, that faith is planted by the word, it flourishes into a tree which bears the fruit of forgiveness into our broken world. When you boil it down to that, it's not a very scandalous thing at all. It's, it's actually quite ordinary. Because faith is simply doing the things that Christ does. It's loving and forgiving. It's healing and encouraging. It's not meant to be flashy. And that's, that's the third thing that, that Jesus tells us about our life in the community of believers. So this, if we wrap up our gospel lesson with this little parable about the master and his servant. When at last the day's work in the fields is done, the servants don't get any special treatment, no special seat at the table. Their duties continue as they prepare the meal, dress properly, and serve the master. And in the end, Jesus tell, tells us it's literally a thankless job. The master doesn't thank his servants. There's no word of praise, no pat on the back, no tip left on the table. The best the servants get is the cold leftovers back in the kitchen. In a job like that, with over many years, probably wear any of us out. The same routine, day in, day out. The same meal, the same conversation, week after week. It's all quite boring. But in the end, that's our life of faith. That's our life as servants of Christ, our Master. We simply do what is our duty. And it's interesting because these are the duties that he's already accomplished. 
work forgiveness. He's already forgiven us, and now he's given us those duties to walk in again and again. So we do these things, you know, we're like, like the servants. They plow the field. We plow the fields of our hearts in repentance so that Christ can plant the seed of forgiveness. And we carefully shepherd the little ones he's given us to care for. He's entrusted them to our care. And then we, we dish up forgiveness, you know, at the table. We dish up forgiveness to ungrateful yet repentant brothers and sisters in Christ. And all this, it's not fancy, it's not flashy. And, all, and we just do it with our eyes fixed on our master because he's the one who's sustaining us, who has given us the work to do, and will give us the power to do it. And we know that despite any ingratitude we might face, the true grace of Christ's reward will be beyond compare. And in the end, yes, all these things are duties. They're all burdens that we must carry for one another as Christians. But as Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. And this is a light burden because he carries them with us. And as unexciting and insignificant, as troublesome as they may seem, they have eternal ramifications. Because through them, through forgiveness, through taking care of our little ones, through simply doing our Christian duty, this is how the kingdom of God flourishes and expands. It's through them that Christ spreads the word and creates faith in other people. There's no other way that it happens. Thing is, it's kind of hard to detect. You can't really see it. The fruits aren't always that visible. And it happens really slowly. But that's when we take Habakkuk's word, the words to heart. He tells us, if it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus, amen.